Yeah, so welcome. This is our first joint event between the Better Way Alliance and the local Vancouver. Um, and we have a really, we hope, inspiring and energizing um, hour. So um, my name is Lily Camacho. I'm one of the directors at the Better Way Alliance. Uh, and I'm joined with Aaron Binder, who wave, say hello. He's the other director here. Um, and Sorry, we are, there's, we basically decided to host this event because we, some of the Better Way Alliance members are B corporations as well. And we had noticed there's a lot of overlap in business values between Better Way Alliance business owners and B Corp business owners, often they're the same person. So we thought it would be a really fun opportunity to bring folks together to across networks, to meet each other, to share stories and inspiration, and to kind of hear um, from a more, personal angle of leadership um, and share learnings um, and just give give you an opportunity to chat and uh, yeah, really make this your time. So who is the Better Way Alliance? If you are unfamiliar with us, the Better Way Alliance is a network of business owners that support ethical employment. We advocate for good employment policies by engaging with governments, politicians, and journalists uh, and across Canada's wider business community. Specifically, we support um, three legislative priorities. One is more than minimum wages. Another is paid sick days, which is very, um, has the attention of the media today. And the third is stable scheduling. So really like offering a quality job, um, offering um, part-time workers more hours before hiring a new worker, that sort of thing. Um, we're also joined by Michelle Reed, who is the Community Engagement and Activation Lead for B Corporation US in Canada. So Michelle, if you want to say a few words of welcome, go ahead. Oh, for sure. So hi, everyone. Um, and thank you to Better Way Alliance for having us today. Um, there may be some B Corps on the call and there may be not some, um, but for those of you that may not know, um, B Corps are businesses that really act in ways uh, that benefit society as a whole. And what really kind of defines them is really their belief that purpose of a company is really beyond profits, but also having that social and environmental good. Uh, fun fact, here in Canada, we have over 430 B Corps that are part of this movement, and many um, have built companies that are really helping to solve some of the biggest social and environmental problems that we're experiencing today. And kind of part of uh, the commitment B Corps really make is to consider all stakeholders, uh, but we realize this isn't enough. Um, really to create kind of these meaningful impact, there needs to re be systems-wide change so that everyone's really playing by the same rules and are really accountable to their workers, communities, and the environment. Um, through B-Lab and US Canada, we support this work through several channels, which can include direct advocacy and working with partners and through B Corp advocacy. And so I really hope today um, by hearing the panelists that you'll be inspired with ways you as a leader and as a business um, can really use your voice to really kind of create this greater impact. Amazing. Thanks so much, Michelle. So just to give you a quick rundown of how the um, agenda will flow today. We have about 20 minutes of a panel. So we've been we're joined today by um, four Better Way Alliance members. Um, they'll each have a few minutes to share their stories and then we'll open the floor for another 20 to 25 minutes or so to um, everyone to both host the kind of Q&A session and then also have the opportunity to share your own stories of how you've engaged in advocacy and in leadership and impact building. And then we'll just wrap up near the top of the hour with some closing remarks. We do have a quick poll to start us off. And this is to see where everyone is at in their own leadership journey. So there are no wrong answers. I'm just going to um, start it now. Oh. Hmm, it has disappeared. Having some technical difficulties. Aaron, can you see if there is a, Aaron or Jess actually, one of you might be on the host, should be under polls. Sorry about this, folks. You should uh, see that popping up shortly, everyone. <laughs> I'm 
just wish I could answer this too. Someone confirm that they can see the poll because I can't. Yeah, it's coming in. Okay, great. And uh, 10 of 12 have answered. So whoever the two other ones are, I hope you're enjoying your pizza. Oh, one, one to go. <laughs> but uh, just, uh, oh. But that also might be because I logged into the BWA account. That is why. My bad. Well, let me let me go over some results since no, <laughs> the two of you can't see it. Uh, where are you at in your impact leadership journey? Nine percent. This is all brand new to me. Hello, welcome to our world. Twenty-seven uh, percent. I'm dipping my foot into the water and thinking about what this might look like for me. Also, welcome. You're in the right spot. Thirty-six percent. I'm comfortable with impact in my sector and thinking about how to expand my reach. That is a good spot to be. I was there a few years ago and it led me to this. So it's a really good launch pad. 27%, again, I'm an active advocate on a number of issues. Wild horses can't hold me back. I'm glad I didn't read that one first. Um, and 0%, I love this concept and we'll engage when the time is right. So it sounds like we've got a really active group of folks here that are interested in engaging more and that is exciting to hear so thank you for taking the poll and uh yeah let's keep it rolling all right so aaron is going to kick off the um panel so he'll give each speaker an intro and then each of the speakers will go we'll ask that you hold your questions for the end of the panel at which point we'll open the floor um, and you can either, I'll remind you, but you can raise a hand or you can type your questions in the chat. So uh, Aaron, over to you. Yeah, so just a slight preamble. Everyone, um, everyone here that's speaking today is going to share their stories of leadership and advocacy, how it all works together. Um, my personal belief is like every business is a social enterprise. I get the sense most people here would agree with that. Um, so it's kind of cool that we get to hear about their focus, their motivations and challenges um, to being public leaders and the perspectives on the roles that leadership, public leadership plays um, for business owners in society. And definitely we'll be hearing some suggestions on how you can all harness um, the, that same energy and create greater impact in your communities, whether that's just on your street, your town, your city, your province, your country, the world. Um, so one thing I will ask is just hold your questions till the end, and then we'll open the floor to everyone, have a, a really good discussion afterward. And um, first I'd like to introduce Helmi Ansari. He's the CEO and Chief Sustainability Officer of Grosh International. If you haven't heard of them, you are going to today and you'll probably become a customer of theirs if you aren't yet. Um, they're one of the leading providers of craft coffee and tea brewing gear for home use across Canada, and that's increasing to North America. Um, they're sold in retailers like Hudson's Bay, Saks Fifth Avenue, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Whole Foods. They are uh, a certified B Corp and a carbon neutral living wage employer and a fabulous BWA advocate. Since 2010, uh, their Safe Water project has funded over 150 million days of safe drinking water uh, for those in need in countries in the global south. And uh, it's really a, a great honor every time I get to talk to Helmi, and it's an even greater one to introduce him right now today. So Helmi, it's all yours. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining and listening for a few minutes. Um, so Aaron and Lily asked if we would share a bit of our story of why we got started. And perhaps I'll start with that. 15 or 16 years ago, my wife um, took our two daughters that we had at the time on uh, traveling to meet her parents. And she was in Karachi. And one of her daughters, who was 10 months old at the time, was with my wife. She ended up getting waterborne illness. She got a, a version of stomach cholera, which is fatal at about 50% of the time. She was 10 months old. Um, 
she passed out in my wife's arms, started to become cold, turned blue, her mouth and her fingertips started to turn blue. So obviously my wife panicked, ran her out into the street and started running to hospitals. And there was a religious holiday and there was a procession going on. She got stuck in traffic three hours, reached the first hospital. They said, we're sorry, your daughter's too far gone. There's not too much we can do for her now. You might want to try the other hospital. So she picks up this cold child that is um, unconscious and tries to run to the next hospital, another three hours in traffic. Finally gets there. They say, we're sorry, we can't do too much. Somehow a surgeon that's passing by happens to see and says, let me try one last thing. Let me try to shave her head and see if I can hydrate her brain because her veins in her body have already collapsed. So he shaves her head, sticks a needle in her brain, and he's able to hydrate her. Three and a half days later, our daughter, our daughter bounces back. Um, so that was a very difficult time for us. And, and I find it difficult to talk about this every time I do mention it. But at that point in time, we had a decision to make. If I was going to continue my life in the corporate world, working for a Fortune 50 in a very successful corporate career and just keep working up the corporate ladder, which felt more like a hamster wheel, or do I decide that we're going to spend the rest of our lives doing something different? So we chose the latter. And since then, we've been running Grosh with the singular purpose of trying to run a business that's true to our values. And that's in business to, say, to make money to run our safe water projects around the world. Um, today, we run our safe water projects in six different countries. And we have funded over 300 million days of safe drinking water for people in need through the Grow Safe Water Project. So we're, we have the good fortune, we can travel around the world, go to these places, live in Sudan, India, Philippines, Pakistan, and help these people and change their lives through selling coffee, tea, and hydration gear. We've tried to build Grosh as a company that is true to our values. So we are carbon neutral. Uh, we're a living wage champion, uh, BWA member, B Corp, uh, woman-owned business, um, and so on. My goal when people ask me, what is your goal with Grosh? I tell them nothing less than to change the world. They're like, oh, you've got to be joking. How can you change the world? You're one, you're a company that started in the laundry room of our house 15 years ago. Do you really think you can change the world? And the answer I tell them is absolutely. We can change the world. You see, nonprofits, I think, play a very important role in our, in our world, but Altogether, they are still just 2% of the world's economy. It's a for-profit business, which is 98% of the world's economy that has the money in it, that has the ability to go make transformational change on a large and a grand scale. That's the reason my wife and I said, if we're really going to have a big impact, we're going to start this business with $6,000 from a cash-in RSP. We'll launch a line of products, and we will make it so successful so incredibly successful that we will inspire other for-profit businesses to say, oh my God, look at these guys, these, this husband and wife team that started from a basement. They're taking away our market share and they're doing that while paying fair wages, being carbon neutral, not making promises of we'll be carbon neutral in 2055 or something irrelevant like that. But we're doing that today and we're selling real products at competitive price points and you can do all this. We should be more like Grosh. So our goal is to change the world by inspiring other businesses to see the real value in being fair to employees, taking care of the environment, doing work locally and doing work globally. Because I believe, and my personal belief is, if we need to make dramatic, large scale change, that business that is run with ethics is the last great hope for me to see that in my generation. Aaron, I think my five minutes are up. I will not steal time from anybody else. I will stop there and I look forward to questions in a few moments. Thank you, Helmi. That was really well said. And uh, yeah, it, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Ryan. And he's the executive director of the North York Harvest Food Bank. Um, they're one of our newer members and we're really happy to have them on board um, because they are one of the non uh, or not-for-profits that are a member of ours and they're championing great jobs. 
Ryan believes in strong partnerships and that the nonprofit sector does play a vital role in building healthy, vibrant communities. And he has been a vocal champion for the organization's approach to community wealth building, social enterprise, and workforce development. He's the past chair and currently serves on the board of directors of Feed Ontario and is a former member of the Ontario Nonprofit Network's Policy Committee and the Toronto Food Policy Council. So it's an absolute treat to have you here today, Ryan, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Aaron. Um, and thank you, Helmy, and thank you uh, all of you for attending today. Uh, it's really an honor for us to be part of uh, the Better Way Alliance um, and to be part of this discussion uh, today. So uh, uh, hopefully in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our uh, journey as an organization. Um, as Aaron said, I am the executive director of the North York Harvest Food Bank. We are the primary distributor of emergency food in uh, northern Toronto. Um, we operate as a distribution hub, uh, primarily, and uh, distribute food through a network of 40 different organizations. So we collect food and funds and then redistribute that out to community members through that network. Uh, in addition, uh, as Aaron mentioned, we operate a social enterprise, which makes up about, um, this year should be about 25% of our overall revenue, uh, but maybe more importantly, also allows us to extend our reach as an organization. Um, and so what we do is use our infrastructure uh, and our expertise to provide uh, wholesale food procurement, logistics, and distribution services uh, to nonprofit and public sector institutions, uh, large and small, uh, all across Toronto. So in a, as I said, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to try to tell you our journey. I think the theme that I'm going to try to link a few different things to um, is that the way you state a problem, the way we frame problems, ultimately drives uh, the solution. And the way we do that in our work, uh, the way we frame problems is ultimately a political act. And so what do I mean by that? I think if we go back to the origin of uh, North York Harvest is one of the uh, earliest food banks in the country. Uh, we were founded in uh, 1985. And so we've been here for uh, going on now 18 years. Um, and we started in our founder's apartment. I'm the third executive director uh, in the history of the organization. And, you know, Lauren, our founder, uh, looked and saw, two, you know, two kind of basic things, that there was so much food in certain areas, uh, food that was going to waste, and there were so many people in other areas that didn't have enough food. And so he started, um, you know, as a volunteer in his apartment, uh, North York Harvest Food Bank, to literally help his neighbors uh, on uh, in that building. Uh, and that's a really simple concept, you know, take the food from one place, move it to another place, uh, elegant uh, even. Uh, but it's ultimately underpinned by a notion of scarcity, that there's just not enough food. And, and if we, we got to redistribute it through this large kind of complex network uh, in order to make it all, make it all last what that did, that, that sort of mindset permeated through not just North York Harvest, but food banks, again, all across the country, uh, in a lot of ways that actually became quite problematic, and that we know today to be quite problematic. So food banks, and still this happens in certain places today, uh, tend to hoard food or have historically done so. Um, you know, we, we uh, means test or income test um, our, uh, our client base. North York Harvest doesn't do that, but this is something that happens still uh, across the sector. And we've overly relied on volunteers as the sort of core labor strategy uh, for our organization, stemming from, you know, Lauren uh, in his apartment. But as I said, we know 35 years, uh, 30, 37 years of doing this work, uh, that that really simple narrative, that simple framing is incorrect. And so we now know that people are not food insecure because there's not enough food, particularly uh, in Toronto, where I am. Um, we're, we live in one of the richest cities and one of the richest countries on the planet, uh, both in terms of uh, financial riches, but also agricultural ones. So, the, you know, we now say there's no food solution to food insecurity because people are not um, in food insecure or hungry uh, because there's not enough food. Uh, they are food insecure or hungry because they cannot access the food that already exists and the wealth that is required uh, to acquire that food. So ultimately, food insecurity is a function of poverty, which is ultimately a function of inequality and exploitation. And when you frame the problem that way and you do that in an honest way, then I think you have to turn the critical lens uh, you know, inward and examine your own policies and practices. And that's what we've done over, I would say, the last 12 years or so. Um, so going back about 12 years, we changed our mission statement. Our board of directors changed the mission statement to include 
focused advocacy and long-term solutions to poverty in addition to uh, in addition to the emergency food support uh, that we uh, that we provide and what i learned you know early in my career um, as a leader of the organization is that what we were doing was trying to produce a poverty uh, anti-poverty product, if you will, in the, in the form of the food and services we provide, uh, but doing it in a way that was poverty promoting. So we had a lot of precarious work. We had a lot of, you know, poor labor conditions. And so what we have done over that period of time um, is really try to try to address that so that we can lead by example and so we can have credibility when we advocate for both the private and the public sector. So just real quickly, a couple of things that we have done over the past number of years. Um, we have dramatically reduced the number of employees that are on limited time contracts, and so time-based contracts. And for those that are for various reasons, uh, we put premiums in place. So they make more than they would otherwise as a full-time employee um, to compensate for that precarity. Uh, we've eliminated all of our unpaid internships, and we now start any training program at $17.79 an hour, which is above our minimum wage. And then again, with the, those premiums on top of that. Our lowest, uh, our lowest uh, wage for full-time employees or regular non-training employees is $20 an hour. And we have a, a 4.3 times ratio between the lowest salary band and the highest salary band. So the difference between there, we've tried to drive a little bit of equity across our pay band. Um, last year, we defined, uh, deployed a defined benefits pension plan. Uh, we have a pretty robust uh, group health dental uh, life insurance plan. Um, and we have uh, 12 wellness days a year. And so what did we find? Because I'm sure there are people that are out there saying, well, that's great, Ryan, you run a charity and that's wonderful that you can do these, these great things, but I got to make money. I got to make profit. And as I said, we run a social enterprise, so we're well aware of that um, and we balance our budgets as well. But what's really important, again, getting back to that idea of how you frame the problem is we sort of reject that as a, as a false choice. And what we have found through our experience is the more that we have invested in our employees and the more that we have reformed our practices, the better our quote unquote business results have become. And uh, whether you measure that through food raising or fundraising, really any, any sort of KPI that you punch well above our weight relative to um, sometimes much larger, much better known organizations. Uh, one just other quick. Ryan. He did know. Yes. I, I'm just going to cut in here um, and mention uh, I, I've got a bunch of questions I want to ask you. So, um, yeah, can uh, let's wrap it up. And then I definitely have three or four that I will get to in 10 or 15 minutes. Sounds good, Aaron. As I said, what we what we have seen is the way you frame the problem dictates the solution. And so we would like to frame our frame the problem today is it, it is a false choice between investing in your employee base and have running a successful, sustainable, profitable organization. Beautifully said. And thank you for joining us today, Ryan. Um, I think you're doing something really, really cool. Uh, I'm a huge fan of reframing things myself. So I like I am not kidding. I wrote down three questions while you were talking. So um, <laughs> we will get there soon. But first, I want to introduce uh, one of my uh, one of the folks that I think is just brilliant uh and a great bwa member and just endless boundless energy anita agarwal and she's the ceo of multi-award winning canadian jewelry manufacturing company best bargains and uh jewels forever uh she also teaches at centennial college i had the chance to speak at one of her classes uh in the fall and she really engages students in a way that uh, I appreciate it. It's how I would have liked all of my teachers to engage me as a student. Um, so it's really exciting to have here, her here today to talk a little bit about her and her family's journey with their business. So Anita, please have at. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I actually joined the BWA back in 2017. Uh, in Ontario, we were having this uh, political discussion about whether or not the minimum wage should be increased. But of course, as a typical refrain, the government was saying, well, what about small businesses? Small businesses can't afford to do this. And I was speaking just casually to a friend and I was like, 
oh God, I wish there was an organization of businesses who actually countered this harmful narrative because I don't know any small businesses who pay the minimum wage. In fact, I only know small businesses, regardless of if they own a restaurant or if they own a law firm that pay substantially more than the minimum wage. And so my friend was like, yes, I know about the BWA, you might want to join them. And I was like, thank goodness, there's something that advocates for this change. So that was my main reason. But then um, the second reason why I think it's so important is because I don't think that in our political narrative at the moment, there is a total understanding of the severe affordability crisis that we're living in. I mean, I just wish most politicians would try living on minimum wage for a month. I mean, imagine them trying to live on minimum wage, pay rent, pay for groceries, pay for their cell phone, forget about Netflix or any of the subscription services. You don't have any money to spare. So the fact that businesses can speak out about this is just so refreshing and necessary. Um, lastly, in terms of why I joined the BWA was because I've been on the other side of activism. I've um, worked on housing issues, climate issues, and diversity issues. And let me tell you, we don't take activists seriously. Um, they're kind of your weird, naive, crazy cousin at the family gathering that you want to avoid because they're just going off on their own tangent, right? Um, but when you talk to a business owner, you're like, oh yeah, legitimacy, rock star CEOs like Elizabeth Holmes and, uh, you know, uh, Sam Bankman Freed, these people are making it. So those are the main reasons why I joined, um, in terms of something stopping me from speaking out initially when I joined, I was super nervous because I'm quite, um, enmeshed in the women's business community. And I was worried that I would get a lot of negative feedback. And I remember one time I was on this business panel for women in business and several people were having this whisper campaign. They're like, oh my God, is that the annoying minimum wage lady? And uh, I had a couple of friends in the audience and they were like, they deliberately asked me that question about why I support minimum wage. And it made me realize that there's probably a lot of people in that audience that support the same things as my friends. They're just too scared to talk about it. And this is why it's our responsibility to use our voice to get more people on board with these issues. Better minimum wage targets, paid sick days, commercial rent protections, and shorter work weeks. And I'm proud to say in 2020, we implemented that during the pandemic. And I don't think I naturally have uh, leadership abilities. What I truly believe is, is that we are stronger in numbers. Having organizations like the BWA, we know that we're all in this together. We're speaking out. We're not in the minority anymore. I can imagine there's some you know, business owner who's probably thinking these things, but is like, like me in 2017, I wish there was an organization like this, right? And here we are. So strength in numbers to speak out, to challenge those misconceptions about businesses, right? That it's harmful for our bottom line. And um, we're given this respect as business owners in our communities, because we also have a direct impact on making the lives of our team members better. We're directly responsible for their livelihood, their health, and their betterment. And lastly, if nothing convinces you, know that these things are better for business. Um, when we lift everyone up by improving the standard of living, they are more likely to spend more, thus increasing your profitability. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, I love it. And, you know, the, the same reason you found the BWA is the reason I found it. I kept running the math like the around employment in my business and it just didn't add up the way the CFIB says it should. But when we implemented a higher minimum, when we implemented paid sick days, that made a lot of sense for our bottom line too. So I always love hearing from you about that, Anita. It's uh, refreshingly punchy. So thank you for that. And uh, I'm going to throw it to Jess Carpinone as our last speaker, who is uh, the owner, one of the owners, I should say of a fantastic bakery in Hintonburg, bred by us. And uh, she got her start in the food industry in 2011 after completing the baking and pastry program at the Pacific Institute of Culinary Arts. Uh, she 
landed a job in Vancouver, and then a few years later left for Ottawa and opened up Bread by Us with her partner, Sarah. And since day one, they've been dedicated to creating good jobs in the shop. By doing so, they're helping reshape the food service industry into something better and more sustainable for workers and business owners. Um, Jess is also a colleague of ours. Uh, I get the pleasure of working with her uh, at the Better Way Alliance, and she's leading our membership growth strategy, especially in Eastern Ontario. And uh, it's exciting to have her here uh, to tell a little bit about her story. And uh, thank you for being here, Jess, to tell it. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to talk today about my relationship to advocacy, I think. Um, you know, everyone's done an amazing job already. And I, I feel like there's not a whole lot to fill in other than my personal like experience and relationship to it. But I I started um, my my career in, in Vancouver, as Aaron mentioned, and I came from an academic background. Um, and I I guess my first impressions of the food service industry were kind of sh like shocked at just sort of how how bad the conditions were and so I started to gain an appreciation and an understanding of of those challenges back when I started a couple of the big things that stood out to me that I thought okay if I ever you know open my own place I would do this differently are really just like a lot a lot of basic things so I would see things like wage theft. So things like offering people a daily rate, a daily salary instead of paying them by the hour, which resulted in people being paid less than minimum wage. Um, that affected primarily my, my colleagues and my friends who were temporary foreign workers. So I saw kind of the exploitation of foreign workers in the industry. I experienced different types of harassment. I saw my friends experience different types of harassment. Um, and I guess my, my, my first sort of negative experience, or, or I guess one of the more formative negative experiences for me was when I was working in fine dining and I found myself like pretty much the only woman, the only queer person in the kitchen. And I felt, I felt pretty like marginalized in that space. And I, I spent some time working on a business plan at that time. I felt really motivated to do something myself. And when I opened Bread by Us, like ensuring that my workers had sort of better working conditions, but also that I fostered a culture of reciprocity was like really important to me. And of course, back then I didn't know exactly how to do that. But over the years, I think I've, I've honed that muscle of like how to create a good workplace culture. And I think I'm getting better at it at 10 years later. Um, but I've seen how approaching the organization building with reciprocity at the heart of it has really paid off for us. And when I, now that I've experienced that loyalty and that collaboration that happens when you have a well looked after team, I realize how closely linked the political, broader political issues of like labor shortages and essentially like the failures of our industry, like our, our food industry is really in crisis um, in terms of just people not wanting to work in it. And um, yeah, essentially the labor shortage is like front of mind for a lot of people right now. Lots of people left the industry. Um, I've come to appreciate that like the careers there could have could have been there all along and that there's like a, a very direct link between um, how we, how, how, you know, what the employment standards are and the, the challenges that the industry is facing right now. So I see that there's a political moment right now that I want to, that I'm trying to seize, um, especially with COVID and the massive like exodus of labor. I think there's a, a political moment right now where advocacy is, is extra important. So I've always tried to be an advocate, but I feel like it's especially important to seize that when there's a political moment, when people are talking about it. And um, that's just like from a strategic standpoint, like when do I try to push myself to kind of 
stretch myself beyond my um, my comfort level and actually like go hard on advocacy is like during times of political you know opportunity which I think we're in at the moment I found it hard in the past just being insecure and being introverted um, and not having the confidence always to speak um, I have definitely encountered times where I've had to take a step back and say like I can't be the voice I can't be the face and I think that that's like a really valid position for, for anybody to be in. Um, and so I think when you're all figuring out like, where do I fit in as an advocate? Like, I think sustainability on a personal level is really important and knowing these are like long-term fights and having to sort of judge when to, when to go hard and when to step back. Um, and yeah, just as a final thought, because I know I'm in my last minute, I did have more to say, but I'm like, you know, it's fine. Um, one thing that I, that I really struggle with that I think is like a strategic question as business owners and our relationship to advocacy is like, what are the optics of what I'm do of what I'm doing? So I always like, I'm really self-conscious and conscious of how does my advocacy make you how does how does that appear to people so I always worry that that people will think like I'm doing this because I'm trying to make a sale and so I create like a bit of distance between my advocacy work and my business like I don't necessarily talk about a lot of it on the same platform which is like just a personal thing but it's something that I'm that I work that I'm constantly working on like how do I be an advocate and have that advocacy be genuine and genuinely like received as genuine? And so that's just a point of tension for me that I thought might be interesting to, to suss out a bit. Thank you, Jess. And uh, thank you to all the speakers again for taking part today and putting your thoughts forward. Lily, I'll throw it over to you. Okay. That's I loved hearing that. There's so many gems uh, that I'm taking away. I've been like scribbling them down. Um, but you're not here to hear here to hear about what I think is valuable. Um, let's open the floor to. We want to open the floor to questions. So if you have a question for any of the speakers, and then also if you want to take this opportunity to share any sort of motivations for your for for your impact. Uh, making or any challenges that you face, any lessons, any tensions that you're struggling with, that sort of thing that you think could be valuable for the rest of the group. Or if there was anything you heard that really resonated with you, we'd love to hear it. We are mindful of the time. So if you could keep your share to about two minutes, that would be really great. Um, I'm going to pop these questions again in the chat so that you can refer to them. And then the way that we'll field questions is, um, you can raise your Zoom hand and we can call on you. Or if you feel more comfortable writing your question, you can type it in in the chat and then I will, I'll just voice them there and I will just voice them. So I'll give you a few seconds to, to think about your questions. And and Aaron, of course you have, Jillian, can you raise your like Zoom hand instead of your real hand, just cause I can see it better for the next time, but go ahead, Jillian. <laughs> Thanks, Lily. Yeah, I, I always forget like how to raise the hand. That's that's my problem. I think it's like under oh as under reactions or something. Okay. Yes, it's under reactions. Oh, yeah. That's kind of hard. <laughs> there we go. It's up. Um everyone was really great. And I was just wondering if people could share a little bit about um how to overcome. I don't know if you want to call it compassion fatigue, but just kind of like advocacy burnout. Um, like as we juggle our lives and our businesses and we're very busy, like how to not become too discouraged. Like with politics in this province right now, like it can be very discouraging at times. So like, how do we keep up the hope? How do we keep up the energy, the good vibes? Um, and yeah, so I would just love to hear about that, um, especially when like we are, we care so much, like in how many story struck me because it's so meaningful, of course, everyone's story, you know, we, we attach so much meaning to it and we care. So just how do we just not get burnt out on it? 
Jeline, I'll just offer my my personal kind of pickup tool for my mood and my energy level is um, as we're doing this advocacy, we're in front of people who don't see the world the same way as us. And my personal approach is to be so successful that they're forced to see our success and be, hey, we want to be like Hilmi, not because, not just because we want to be better people, but because we want to be successful as well. So that's one way to inspire it. But being with those people is very tiring, is very taxing, because all they care about is greed at the end of the day, mm -hmm. which is a corporate world. Um, I charge my batteries by meeting and hanging out with people like you and other people on this panel and mm -hmm. people that are B Corps. Mm -hmm. So surrounding myself with like-minded people is my battery charge time. Mm -hmm. um, and I love when I get that. And when I feel like I'm tired and I see you know, the work that other people are doing, like Anita or Jess or yourself or what Aaron's up to. And um, I feel like it gives me more wind in my sails to say, wait a minute, that's a great idea. I can do that. I can do more. So that's that's my personal trick for charging batteries is people like you. So you're looking for me to answer and I'm saying <laughs> you are the answer. So there you go. Well, I'm getting recharged from, from you folks right now. Jess, go for it. Yeah, I was going to say, um, for me, the thing that gets me the most burnt out is um, like really public facing moments. So like a media interview or even just like publishing an article or something. And those things are so impactful and so important, I think, for us to like stick stick our necks out. But like I get really messed up after that because I'm like everybody's watching me and everybody's judging me. Um, but what I find is a good way to counter that is to invest time in um, kind of more closed door type of opportunities. So for me, for example, lately I've been working on um, the, I've been, I've had a few meetings with people who are involved in Ottawa's downtown revitalization task force, which is all like closed door stuff right now. Um, it's like getting into rooms and meetings with people who are really influential, like um, developers and landlords and BIA presidents and board of trade presidents and all these different people who, you know, say that they share common goals. And it's like getting in that room with those people, I've been able to kind of try to influence the way they think about things a little bit and like um in a way that like I leave feeling kind of I feel with leave with a sense of pride that I've like accomplished something and that I've maybe persuaded somebody to think about something differently but I don't leave feeling exposed and so I would just say like encourage um encourage people to look for opportunities that feel more invigorating because there's lots of ways to contribute Amazing. Um, I could go to Aaron. I'm just wondering if Ryan, do you have an answer in this to this question as well? We could. I did. Have you I did. Aaron. But I, I did, but I think actually uh, just said it better than I could. Uh, you know, uh, when we when we look at these big challenges, they're big and they're complex, and you know, there's a there's millions of different ways to advocate and to support people that are doing that advocacy. So I think it's really important to kind of get real. Um, with yourself as well to say like, what can I do? What do I want to do? Like, what is energizing? Because this is a long battle. So there's no point in sort of starting something that, you know, suggested is gonna, it's gonna mess you up or is going because you know, you won't last at it. And so if you can kind of find the, the overlap in the Venn diagram of what needs to get done, you know, what do I love to do and what can I do and put those together? Um, that's where I think you get kind of the sustainable solutions. And the other piece I would say that it was also kind of referred to is it's coalitions. Right. You know, when we try, when we silo our approach to advocacy, you know, it's easier to kind of for the resistance to, to sort of pick that off. It, you know, it's these broad coalitions, I think, that uh, are part of the answer. I really yeah, like that sense. answer, Ryan. Uh, I, I am going to keep it real short and just say you're also allowed to turn off. I think that is like really important to remember because we are in this. This is something we all deeply care about. You need to step away from time to time, and that's okay too. And the folks that are your allies, the folks that are that you're in this fight with, they will respect that. They will understand that because they are in it with you too. And sometimes it's okay to just watch Eurovision Fire Saga for a night and not think about things. 
or more than one night. Jalene. Yeah, more than one night, every night for sure. Um, I just wanted to say sometimes we, it's so funny how we all have different capabilities. Like hearing Jess that you talk about how a public appearance will kind of destroy you because you're not sure how you come across and you might feel a little too seen. Um, that is so interesting to me because I just want to say from the outside, you come across for me as like, you know your shit really well and confident and savvy. And so it's amazing what you don't know what's going on in someone's head, but you come across wonderfully. Any other questions, Aaron? I know you said you had a number. <laughs> I I want to open the floor. I, I do have a lot of questions, but anyone else that wants to ask or even comment, talk a little bit about yourselves, uh, I, I'd much prefer to throw it to you first. Um, and that is literally anyone here. <laughs> But I will also ask Ryan a question, which, uh, um, you know, you t I, I really appreciate you mentioned reframing. That's something we talk about a lot internally at the Better Way Alliance is like, how can we turn this into something that will connect with more people um, that makes sense to them? So I'm just kind of wondering, like, what is a recent example of a reframing that has worked well for your team? I think uh, I think there's a couple of examples. I mean, what we try to do with the broad issue is sort of reframe the fault. You know, we, we talk a lot about false choices. And, you know, so, for example, when we talk about poverty, you know, it, it's often positioned as, well, you know, we can invest here, but, you know, there's only so many dollars to go around. Well, what we know is that, you know, poverty drives health care costs. It drives education costs. It drives poor, you know, criminal justice outcomes. It drives, you know, lost productivity, lost wages, lost that, all of these things. So, you know, it's it's sort of rejecting that that choice. I think at a local level or at an organizational level, I'll give you one kind of quick example. You know, through through the last three years of the pandemic, we effectively had unlimited sick days. And the same thing, if you apply that sort of scarcity mindset, well, what's going? You know, everyone's going to walk away. Everyone's going to stay home. You know, we're going to have nothing's going to get done. And what we found actually was that by removing the cap on sick days, we sunk fewer sick days than we had seen previously. It's, it's a matter of sort of reframing that mindset to say, you know, it's kind of a strange dynamic that you think, well, let me disinvest from my employee base, and that's the way I'm going to get some productivity. That's the way I'm going to run a successful organization. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sort of visceral sense, but it's the narrative that often is applied in the lens by which we look at our society. Um, and so what we found is that, you know, there's one small example, one large example um, of where the, the evidence doesn't back that narrative up. And part of our job as advocates, or we believe, is is to correct that notion uh, as best we can. Thanks, Ryan. We'll do Jess, and then we will have to wrap up. Um, I was going to like ask a question to the panel, or maybe even just put it out to the group. But I think about a, a lot about how to like use the skill sets that I already have to like like as a leader like things I've developed over the years um like how to kind of use that in my advocacy and like lean into my strengths and I just wonder if like anybody on the panel or someone wants to kind of kind of comment a bit about like what skills do you have in your workplace that you find trend like that you've honed over the years as like managers or leaders that you find translate well, because I think some of the newer folks to advocacy might not even realize like what kind of skills they have with like that they've already developed that would that translate to the advocacy type work. I'm wondering if anybody wants to like touch on that. Yes, I don't know about skills, but I think one of the habits I've built up over time is to try and look at complex problems, but in a very simple and a very personalized way to make it real for myself. And as I translate that into advocacy, and when I talk to people about 
why I think paying a living in a fair wage is important. I don't tell them, I don't give them statistics. I give them an example of when I walked into a staff member's home who was making more than minimum wage back when we paid, I think, 13 or 14 back when minimum was 10, thinking we were one of the good guys. And she had two kids. And when I walked into her home, I was dropping her off after a company event and picked up her daughter's stroller and took it into her house. And I saw her house and I saw the condition that she was trying to raise her kids in. And I realized that I was part of the problem, thinking that I was paying more than a minimum, but I didn't pay a living wage. So for me, my skill set that I found is how to take a complex problem but turn it real with real world examples. And the more mm -hmm. I've recognized that, I try to communicate in that way. So each one of us has different characteristics, different habits, different skills we've picked up. So, you know, for you, I know that whenever I hear you speak about things, you are very genuine in how you come across and you are very real and very relatable in terms of your experiences. I still remember the stories of, you know, you and your bakery and sick days and how all that transpired. So stories stick with us and they, mm -hmm. they stay real more than facts and numbers and data. So by making things simple and real, I find what I say lasts. Um, so that's how I try to speak. So that's one tip from mm -hmm. me if it's helpful. I think you kind of hinted at this earlier, Jess. Everyone's at a different point in their journey. So being able to contribute what you can, when you can is really valuable and having a good understanding of that. And um, you know, just realizing that some people might be able to contribute this much and others might be able to contribute this much, I think is really worth recognizing. I, I love that poll, the poll results earlier because it just shows like, even in a, uh, out of 12 results, you can have five different answers. <laughs> and that that's really important to remember. So I, I think that, um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's all I got to say. Thank you, everyone. This has been a really energizing event for me. I have loved hearing from all the panelists. Uh, I've loved hearing your stories and also just how real everyone has been about like uh, their, where they are all at personally and what they all struggle with and all the kind of your own lessons. So I really appreciate you sharing. And thank you everyone for coming. I'm going to pass it to Michelle for a few comments from B Lab. Yeah. Well, thank you all as well. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Um, and it's always great to see leaders with with great passion. And um, y'all are very brave um, because it's a, you need to need to be brave to kind of be in this space to just really kind of put yourself out there. So I just wanted to say I appreciated that. Um, if you're interested in kind of learning more about uh, BLAB US and Canada's policy engagement work, um, we'll just uh, put a link uh, just in the chat there. Um, I will caveat it, most of it is US based, um, but we are moving into Canada um, with a small group of leaders and partners and policy areas that we want to explore further. So definitely stay tuned for details. Um, would also encourage everyone in this call, I know there's probably a lot of Ontario folks, but to really engage with your Be Local communities, um, especially with Be Local Ontario, they have been involved in some advocacy work really on important regional issues. I think most recently they were doing a petition to help save the green belt. So it'd be a, another good organization to, to kind of band with um, and we're stronger together for sure. Um, also just wanted to say, we also just have a really great Earth Month uh, toolkit in there. There's some really great um, resources just for pertaining to climate action and also advocacy as well. Um, and then very lastly, um, I wanted to invite you all to join us for a B Corp Leadership Development Day that we have in May. This is open to everyone and we'll be focusing on rec reconciliation within businesses. And, and this will be a virtual conference that we'll do across Canada and really bringing Indigenous voices um, and also companies that are actually really involved in this work. So we really hope that you can join us for that. Um, and thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Michelle. Do you have a, a link for that, Michelle? Sorry. Yeah, I do. Let me just uh, 
I think it might be the last link in the chat that I sent. So it's already there. And yes, if you want to connect with, yeah, perfect. Okay. And if you want to connect with Michelle, you can find her on email or on LinkedIn and that's their website. And then from us, most of you are BWA members, um, but I will we'll try and move the screen ahead so that you can see our direct contact information. Gosh, there we go. So feel free to send us an email. Again, we always have um, ways that you can get involved in, in different ways that might be more suitable to you. If you like to write, we often do, um, we're often looking for authors of op-eds to, to send into media outlets. Um, there's opportunities to meet with your MPP. Uh, and we do actually have an exciting upcoming event that Aaron can tell you about. That I can. Uh, we are going to Queens Park on May 16th to talk commercial rent and ethical employment. So we're looking to put together a crew of passionate people that uh, want to go talk to a bunch of politicians across all four parties. And uh, I think it's going to be pretty exciting because we will also be hosting a reception afterward. I love those kinds of things because I'm weird, but uh, I think it'll be a good time. And um, we'll be prepping a bunch of uh, workshops as well on how to talk to MPPs, how to speak to media. Um, I think some of you already have a lot of experience with that. Um, so it's good practice. And uh, if you're interested, just get in touch with us and we will uh, we'll, we'll tell you about the next steps and would love to see you there. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. That concludes the event thank you so much everybody for coming great to see you all and thanks so much for thank our panelists you as well thanks okay. to everyone for coming thank Bye. you